This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to Syria, where Reuters reports airstrikes killed 12 and injured dozens more Tuesday at a market in, north, in the northwest province of Idlib. This is the latest in a Russian-backed offensive by Syria's military in northwestern Syria that's killed more than 600 people and at least 157 children in the past three months, according to the Syrian Network for Human Rights. The attacks have reportedly targeted schools and hospitals. More than half a million people have died in Syria. Syria since the uprising against the regime of Bashar al-Assad began in 2011. As demonstrations broke out, a young economic student began filming on a cell phone in her native city of Aleppo. For five years, Rad al-Khatib documented her own life and the lives of those around her as the Assad regime intensified its brutal response to the protests. She eventually gathered hundreds of hours of footage. In the course of her stunning, award-winning documentary feature titled For Sama, Wad falls in love with one of the last remaining doctors in Aleppo, gets married and has a baby girl, Sama, to whom the film is dedicated. This is the film's trailer. Aleppo, Madinti, my city. <laughs> I keep filming. It gives me reason to be here. This is insane. We're getting this every day. None of us had any idea. Hello, Dr. Hamza. Our old lives would be changed forever. Hamza. Hamza, I'm pregnant. Sama. Sama. <laughs> I've made this film for you. I need you to understand what we were fighting for. I love you so much, even more than the snow. There's lots of airstrikes today, right? Sama, I know you understand what's happening. I can see it in your eyes. You never cry like a normal baby would. That's what breaks my heart. The hospital has been bombed. My daughter's in there. Sama, will you ever forgive me? That's the trailer of the critically acclaimed award-winning feature documentary for Sama. It's directed by Wad al-Khatib and Edward Watts. The film will be released in the United States next Thursday, screening first in New York, Los Angeles and San Francisco. To talk more about the film and the war at documents, we're joined here in New York by the director, Wad al-Khatib, also with us, Dr. Hamza al-Khatib, a doctor and co-founder and former director of the Al-Quds Hospital in Aleppo. He is Wad's husband and features prominently in the film. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! I know you just flew in uh, from London. Uh, here to New York. It is great to have you with us. Go back to your time as a student of economics and your decision to go to Aleppo to start to document what was happening there. Uh, thanks for having us first. And it's really, like, very um, heartbreaking and sad, you know, to go back to that great moments when the uprising started in Syria, when we felt that really we, 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 not, we don't just can change our life, but also we will change the world. And the feeling, the hope that we have, the powerful about we can really do something to change our life and 
the dream of the freedom, all these great principles that we were grow up on, but we didn't thought that we will have it in Syria as country. And that moment were just very, very important for us. And it was very also, uh, there's a lot of mis misunderstanding and misinformation because of the propaganda by the uh, by Assad regime at that moment. So it was just really important to document this moment and save it to the history, to our life, to, to the next generation. You where were you born? Uh, I was born in Aleppo. And talk about what happened. Start with the protests in 2011. Uh, it was just normal life. I was a student. Uh, like, I had that dream about when I will finish, I will graduate from economics, and then I will go maybe to Germany to have master and start, like, new life outside, and then I will be back later. But I didn't have that feeling of belong to Syria as a country, and I wasn't feel that I'm the citizen, Syrian citizen. We weren't that proud of before. And then when the revolution started, we just felt that we are in the moment where we can really change our life and make the, the country that we want, build our own life uh, in the way that we really respect ourselves and respect the people we have, respect the government that it should be for us. And We've just started the protesting. Uh, with the same time, everyone uh, who, I was, who uh, was activist was trying to make a rule to, uh, for this go cause, and that's why I felt I can film. And I love filming. I love. Uh, I be really believe in the picture, and that's why I just started document this moment. But no one had any idea about what the future you will never hold for stopped. us. You just no. seem to have that camera on all the time. Yeah. And really, it was very, like, gradually to the moment that you don't think about what you are trying to do or what, what, why are you doing this. It's more about just living the life and saving these moments because you feel that at any moment it could be ended. You could be killed, like, by bombing, by shelling, by anyone arrested you because you are just oppositions. And this is just was very, very important. Well, I mean, the film is extraordinary on, on many levels, uh, but also the sense it's quite visceral. I mean, the audience feels as though they're literally immersed uh, uh, in the war. And it's also told from a perspective that's very unusual for a so-called war film. You're not on the front lines. You're in a hospital. You're in the room in which you're living uh, with your husband and, and then your little girl. Uh, and one of the at one of the screenings uh, in England, uh, Channel 4 host uh, Jon Snow said, in fact, that you captured a female perspective of a masculine war. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Uh, it's more about, you know, I feel everything was really normal. I, did, I had no idea about I will make this film, but I just feel uh, like believed in the picture that this is really important to be saved. More than anything about, you know, I will do a film, I will speak in perspective of a woman or a female or a mother or whatever. I just was trying to live my life normally. And it was just a life mixed between the journalist and, uh, like, a journalist in one moment and a mother in a second moment. And the film was just mixed between these two feelings about normal life under the war. And <laughs> as I was really amazed with the life there, uh, how powerful people were there, how uh, the sadness, how was the happiness, everything I was seeing in my own eyes, I just felt that this is really should people outside know about this and know about the war in Syria? It's not just war. It's more about life, and people deserve to be alive. You and Hamza, let me just... You um, were a doctor when the protests began, but you were based in western Aleppo. And when rebels took control, uh, the opposition took control of eastern Aleppo, you made the decision to move. Why? Uh, because of, like, we've seen a lot of areas where the oppositions were holding in, uh, taking control in Syria, and the regime immediately started to shelling it with different kind of weapon. We've seen, like, in, in Dara, in Homs. So when it was announced like, that east part of Aleppo is, like, liberated by, from the regime and it's controlled by the opposition, all the images I had of that, like, YouTube, YouTube clips that I've seen through the previous year of, like, children, people being shelled and attacked, and then when I decided just to to go there, like, I'm an activist, I was protesting, and I'm a doctor, so that's the place that I need to be there. So, Dr. Hamza Al-Khatib, you, well, you weren't married at the time you were no. filming. You sort of fell in love through that lens of your camera, I think. And 
Can you describe the setting up of the Okhotsk hospital and who was brought in there? Who were you treating? Yeah. Uh, the first time I moved to east part of Aleppo, there was like uh, it was very chaotic situation, uh, sort of a shelling. People don't used to do, to do that. A lot of people fled out of the the city to the countryside or to western part of Aleppo because they don't know what's going to happen. And like after two months, a lot of civilians came back to Aleppo, and like the pollution reached. Like uh, at one, like in 2013, it reached like 1.5 million people in east part of Aleppo, and that's when like I and a group of doctors decided that we should set a hospital that like a non-trauma hospital it should be like oncology, pediatric, internal medicine, cardio cardiology, uh, because most of the focus of the NGOs was about trauma and surgeries, while there are so many other diseases that people uh, might had. And that's when we decided to start Al Quds Hospital, and it was previously it's a private hospital, but it was abandoned. Nobody was there, and I went there with like two midwives, uh, five nurses, and a uh, few volunteers, and we start like to remove the dust, clean everything. It, was, like, it started with one clinic and eight beds uh, ward, and like by the end of 2016, we had around like 56 beds and so many spe specialties, and uh, the staff was 110 people. So the main idea was to, to have an untrauma hospital, but it ended as the, the last hospital in Aleppo. And when you founded the hospital, because of course the Assad regime uh, targeted hospitals as well as schools, and eight out of the nine hospitals in Aleppo had been destroyed. Now, was that the case when you started this hospital? Uh, and the fact that you, you recounted this joke in, in Aleppo, uh, if you want to be safe, you should go to the front line. That's the safest place in Aleppo. So could you explain that and what exactly the situation was with medical care when you started Al Quds? Uh, we started Al Quds at the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, and uh, there, at that time there was maybe five hospitals in, in Aleppo. The number increased with like more NGOs trying to provide uh, help. The first time uh, we we had like uh, witnessed uh, a hospital attack was in a hospital uh, called Dar Shifa. Uh, that was. Like also at the beginning of 2013 or the end of 2012, and a nurse and a doctor was killed during at that attack. And uh, th throughout the years, the regime has uh, become more uh, aggressive. So it was starting with a mortar shell, mortar uh, uh, attacks, and uh, then uh, aircrafts attack, and then the Russian interfere, and that was like the most brutal thing. And uh, through, like in the middle of 2013, we realized that the regime is not trying to to attack the the militias or the opposition fighters. He's trying to break the will of the people. That there is no way you can live out of my control. So the main target was the the hospitals, health facilities, bakeries, uh, electricity, uh, power supplies, uh, schools. And that's why, like, we know that people who were living there, like, there are several mass cars happened at the city, but the front line, like, there's no bullets even. Nothing happened. And we, we start to know, like, OK, like, you want to have a rest? Just go to the front line and you will be Let's go safe. to another clip from the film for Sama. 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 No more sorrow to Things have got so bad now. Your dad can't leave the hospital. So we live here now. This is our room. Behind those pictures are sandbags to protect from shelling. Yes, I'm coming. We do our best to make it feel like home. That's a clip from For Sama, Sama, the baby who was born in the midst of this war, Wad, that you document from the moment you see your um, pregnancy test to telling uh, Hamza to raising your child in Aleppo. 
Uh, Sama was in the point that she was the hope of our small family and small life. And this is was the same things was about all the children who were born in that area and in that place, which is for a long, long time. There was many, many people who have children and trying just to live normal life under this uh, bad circumstances. And it was just, you know, like people, Syrian people wants to live in Syria in a normal way as much as they can under all this shelling and bombardment and just you know, about how the violence was around, how Assad regime and then later uh, on the Russian were trying just to kill, as Hamza mentioned, the people well and the people, uh, uh, like, feeling about life in, in the city more than about really having um, a fight, a fighting against the fighters who were there. And can you say, uh, well, as, as you said, the, the, the regime did not target the rebels. Can you talk about how the composition of the opposition to Assad changed, uh, and that some areas in Aleppo were in fact held by uh, uh, ISIS and Al Nusra? How did you work with those areas? Did you go into those areas? And what was responsible for those people coming in? And as you say, trying yeah. to hijack the revolution. Uh, it's more about you know the the let's say the war in Syria was between Assad and opposition uh, against Assad. But the main things about how the regime was trying not just to have uh, like attacking these areas, but also he was trying to increase having a Nusra and ISIS groups in the area. And as we like we as Syrians, we see that as facts. And many other uh, centers and study cases was very clear about this issue. That in 2012, the regime released all the people who were in their prisons, which they became later leaders in a Nusra and ISIS group. So it was more about, you know, the regime knows what is going on and he was pushing them to be, like, armed and to be uh, more Isla Islamic and also the violence, which is indirect way to make people more, uh, like, have that uh, bad reaction ag against what's going on. So people can really don't have the the right way to, to do their own, uh, like, defense against what was happening. And we lived with these people in many places. We faced ISIS in 2013, and many people who we know, they were uh, arrested. And we could, uh, we too, uh, I lost my cousin in 2013, and he's kidnapped by ISIS, and really we don't know anything about him until now. So ISIS and Nusra and uh, the Assad was all against the real people, the activists who were uh, having their own dream about the freedom and the democracy. And this is what why the revolution started, and this is what we still need until now. And, you know, it's more about, like, controlling the violence that was happening. And just the idea about we left Syria three years ago. Uh, we were displaced out of Aleppo. And we've, we've had all this experience about the shelling, bombing, and every, every bad situation, the siege, and they threatened to be de uh, death or displaced. And now, three years later, the same scenario happening again in the last place in Idlib, which is, like, just unbelievable that how the world's still watching this and just speak about ISIS, which is really did nothing uh, comparing with the regime uh, violence. And if we just go to any uh, center which they document all this death and, uh, uh, like, bad crimes. We're going to have to leave it there, but we'll do part two. Put it online at democratynow.org. Wa'ad al-Khatib and Hamza al-Khatib. I'm Amy Goodman with, with Nermeen Sheikh.